So it was said that had ignorance excused one from punishment, then ignorance would have been better than knowledge. So ignorance is not an excuse. Had ignorance excused one, it would have been better than knowledge because then the person, if he acquired the knowledge, he would make himself accountable. A person should not think that he's excused as long as he's ignorant. Rather, there's an amount of knowledge that every individual is obligated to acquire. That's called the personal obligatory knowledge of the religion. The one who is ignorant of these matters is not excused. That includes knowing about matters of purification, how to make wudu, how to make ghusl, how to make istinja, how to remove najasa. For the woman in particular, she might need to learn some of the rules of vaginal bleeding so that she can distinguish between menstrual blood and postpartum blood and sickness blood. And then she would know when she needs to pray and when she doesn't need to pray because sickness blood does not drop the obligation of prayer like menstrual blood does. So if a woman doesn't know how to determine the sickness blood from the menstrual blood, she might skip prayers that she's obligated to perform. And if she has such sickness bleeding, and likewise, if someone has incontinence of urine, for example, like a man or a woman who has incontinence of urine, how does this person perform the prayer while there's urine always dripping or blood always flowing. A person is obligated to acquire this religious knowledge and he's not excused because he's obligated. Also, when it comes to the prayer, how to determine the prayer times? By observation. How to determine the Qibla? By observation, not by a compass. Not by a phone app, which might be rigged to show you the wrong direction anyway. And other matters. Matters pertaining to fasting and zakah and hajj, of course. And even other matters. Matters pertaining to marriage and divorce. Some people, they think they're married and they're not. And some people think they're divorced and they're not. A person might think that they got out of a marriage and they haven't gotten out of that marriage. What if a woman thought that she was out of her marriage and she wasn't out of her marriage and then she did a contract with another man and then she's living like that? The ignorance will not protect you and ignorance is not an excuse. Also, for example, there's rules pertaining to assaults. Don't Muslims get in fights sometimes? We have disagreements. Might even scrap. So what if you knocked out the Muslim's tooth? What if you did something else? There's rules pertaining to these things. What do you have to do? Inheritance and wills and all sorts of things. Had ignorance excused the person from the punishment, ignorance would have been better than knowledge. The person should just stay ignorant then so he won't get punished for anything. Don't learn how to pray. Don't learn how to fast. Don't learn anything. And then get to paradise scot-free. Why spend your time learning? It was said, read aloud and hear yourself when studying. And don't lay down to study before you've studied on your feet, pacing to and fro. Some of the students of knowledge, when they study, especially in the beginning, when they're just starting, they start out pacing back and forth. And this is a good strategy for you. It helps to keep you focused. Take your book in your hand and stand up and walk back and forth while you are reading aloud and studying, and memorizing. Set a timer for yourself. Some people, they work out, mashallah. They work out consistently. They set timer for themselves. They might work out every two, three days, you know, certain number of days per week, certain number of hours per day, and they do that consistently. But they don't dedicate this time to the knowledge of the religion, which is more deserving. When you do study, read aloud. Yes, you can study without reading aloud. But reading aloud is an advice for one who wants to study his religious knowledge. Because hearing yourself helps to make the knowledge settle into your heart. And don't lay down to study before you've studied on your feet, pacing to and fro. Go for an hour if you can, especially if you're young. 
go for an hour, go for an hour and a half, just going back and forth, back and forth. After pacing, stand still. After standing, sit down. Then, if you are tired but still want to study, if you still have more ambition, because everyone has their own stamina. Some people have the stamina to study all day, nonstop. Some people don't have such stamina. If you are tired but you still want to study, then lay down. And then you can study while laying down. Be mindful. Don't hold your Islamic book upside down. I mean by that, if you're laying down to study, don't hold your book over your face in such a way that the cover of the book is facing the ceiling and the page is facing down towards you, facing the direction of the floor. So if you were to study while laying down, hold the book up in such a way that you're not having the book in that position that I just described to you. However, do not study while bored of studying. Once you get bored, or before that, take a break. There's no shame in saying that a person got bored because this is the nature of the person. You can do something for so long until eventually yourself wants to stop doing that. So when yourself gets bored, then stop. That's okay. You're a human being. Or even before yourself gets bored, if you feel that you are approaching your limit, you're still good, say, soon I will stop. You can keep going or you can stop and take a break. When your energy comes back, get back at it. Or you can even just switch gears. For some people, they can study until they get bored, but actually they didn't get bored of studying. They might have just gotten bored with that particular topic or they might have just gotten bored with that particular book so then what do you do then just switch switch topics so you've studied your aqidah for example you looked over all your notes on belief all of what you've learned for example or some lesson that you had and you got bored but you still want to study you're bored with that topic switch look at the fiqh that you've learned about wudu and ghusl and istinja etc Study that for a while. If you feel that mm, you need to take a break, take a break. If you feel you don't need to take a break, but you'd like to change subjects, then change subjects. Maybe you want to review what you've learned in Tejweed, recitation of Quran, or what you've learned of Arabic language. Review in groups. Reviewing in groups is good. And if you review in groups, among the things that you can do is you can start with whoever, let's say, took the best notes, this person reads their notes, and everyone is checking their notes with that person who's reading. Then you fix your notes. You might have something that that person missed. You say, oh, wait, right here, the sheikh said such and such. And then everybody benefits. They fix their notes, etc. Once that person's finished reading, and everyone's asked their questions, and everyone's discussed whatever was discussed there, then the next person will read the same thing. The same exact lesson that the first person just read, the second person will read it. And then you'll get more benefits like that. And then the third person, and then the fourth person, and like that. That's one way you can study in groups. And there's other ways. And take something like coffee that will give you a boost. No problem with doing such a thing. Vitamins, coffee, and regular exercise also helps to keep your body energized and keep your mind fresh. It was said, the person who gets comfortable with ignorance will avoid the knowledge just like the dung beetle avoids the musk and goes to the feces. It stays away from the knowledge. Like a little kid who doesn't want to do something and if he can, he'll run away or do something else. It was said, become a scholar or a student or at least listen to the knowledge and don't be a fourth type and be ruined. So become a scholar. There's nothing wrong with having the aspirations of being a scholar, especially if you are a person who may have the potential. If you have the potential to become a scholar, whether you're a male or a female, then set that goal for yourself. But this religious knowledge, as you know, is so vast that you won't become a scholar unless you use all of your time in the knowledge. Except, of course, whatever time you need for your errands, 
for your affairs to work or sleep or eat, etc. But the most successful scholars among the Muslims were people who they didn't busy themselves with anything but the knowledge. They ate little. Some of them didn't even get married. And they might work just what they need to sustain themselves. And some of them, they might have been rich so that they used that money to not have to work just so that they could study. So no problem if anyone ever tells you, don't intend to be a scholar. Don't, don't have such arrogant aspirations. You brush that nonsense to the side. You can make such aspirations and you can aspire to become a wali, a highly righteous, pious Muslim saint. There's no problem with such aspirations and such goals and fixing your heart with that intention and working towards it. So become a scholar or a student. That's also very good. In the words of the pious people and the scholars, the students of knowledge are praised. They are praiseworthy. It is a good thing to be a student of knowledge. Also, the student of knowledge dedicates himself to the knowledge. He attends the lessons. And he studies his lessons and he memorizes and teaches others and understands the cases and doesn't get them mixed up and he says them properly, although he's not a high scholar. This is a very good status to have, the status of a student or a learner, if you want, muta'allim. There's one called alim, that means scholar, and there's one called muta'allim, that means a learner, a pupil. So become a scholar or a student, a pupil. Or at least listen to the knowledge. There are still even those who are not studiers. They don't study per se, but they like to listen to the knowledge. They come to the lessons. They sit and listen. And there's no problem with that. Don't discourage people from listening to the knowledge. The people of knowledge encourage the people to listen to the knowledge. And there are blessings in the sessions of knowledge. Even if you don't understand the language of the lesson, there's a blessing in being in the session alone. And for that reason, the Muslims like to take their children, their small children, to the sessions of knowledge because they hope that, their, that the blessings will descend on their children or that their children would benefit from the blessings of the session. And don't be a fourth type and be ruined. It was said, seek the knowledge. If you are unable, then love its people. If you are unable, then at least do not hate them. Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ It means, surely those who fear Allah from the slaves, they are the scholars. From his slaves. Those among his slaves who fear him are the scholars. The scholars, they said, and we might run across a statement or two like this, that um, when a person is acquiring the knowledge, eventually that knowledge will take him over. It will overcome him. It overrides the person. The knowledge that the person has in his heart will, will take him over. It will overcome his actions and his thoughts. So he thinks in accordance with the knowledge. He acts in accordance with the knowledge. And, of course, there are people who acquired the knowledge and they're not good people. It's possible. Allah Ta'ala could misguide someone with knowledge. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, for example. He had a lot of knowledge. And he was misguided with knowledge. Allah says, Surah Al-Jafiyah, Ayah 23. Which means, how about the one who worships whatever he wants and he obeys his desires with religious devotion? وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ And Allah misguided him with knowledge. But, usually, mashallah, um, more often than not, when the person is busy with the knowledge, then this will reflect and this would make the person a better person. It was said, the greatest people in status are those who are between Allah and his slaves, and they are the prophets and scholars. As for the prophets that is known to you, that the prophets are the greatest of people in status. And as for the scholars, the, uh, the rank of the scholars is one that is extremely high. 
those who would surpass the scholars other than the prophets are the pious people. A pious person is better than a knowledgeable person because piety requires knowledge. So you won't even become pious without having knowledge in the first place. However, piety does not require in-depth knowledge. Piety does not require the knowledge of a scholar. A person can become a pious Muslim without becoming a scholar. And if a person is a pious Muslim, then he is better than a scholar as a pious Muslim, unless that scholar is pious. So, the pious person is better than the non-pious scholar, but the pious scholar is better than the pious person who is not a scholar. Even the caliph needs the scholars. It was said, Imam Ahmed said, the knowledge is in vaults that Allah distributes to whom he accepts. Had the knowledge been only for specific people, then the family of the Prophet wasallam would be most deserving. However, Ata was Ethiopian and Yazid ibn Abi Habib was a black Nubian and Al-Hasan was a slave of the Ansar, an ex-slave, and Ibn Sirin was a slave of the Ansar. All of these people became among the highest of ulama, among the highest of scholars. So that knowledge, Allah gives it to whomever he wills. Don't feel about yourself that I cannot get the knowledge, I cannot acquire the knowledge. Allah gives the knowledge to whomever he willed. Make dua for yourself and then put the effort. What's probably not going to happen is that you'll become knowledgeable without going to sit with teachers. But if you put the effort and you go and you learn and you take notes and you study and you memorize and you teach, inshallah, you will become knowledgeable. And also you don't have to be young to start learning. If a person is old, and is now introduced to the knowledge, let that person not be discouraged from trying to become a scholar. Don't say, I'm old now, it's too late for me to become a scholar. Didn't you hear the story of that scholar who his profession before he busied himself with the knowledge was that he was a locksmith or a lock maker? I don't know if a locksmith is a lock maker. He was a lock maker. He was an expert, and he was already an older man. And there was a Muslim scholar who also was a lock maker, but he wasn't as good a lock maker as that lock maker. So both of them made locks, and the one who wasn't a scholar, his lock was superior to the lock of the Muslim scholar. But the people liked the lock of the Muslim scholar more than his. So he asked, why do they like his lock more than mine? My lock is better than his. So the answer he got was, he's a Muslim scholar. That's why. So that, by the will of Allah, threw the love of the knowledge into his heart. So he wanted to acquire the knowledge of the religion. So he went to a scholar to start learning. And when you start learning from the beginning, you start with the small books. So this grown man, older man, he started and he was charged with memorizing a small text. And the author of that text, he started his book by saying, Hatha kitab This is a book that I have summarized. So that man, he's trying to memorize this book. All day, repeating this line. He woke up the next day, and he forgot. And he felt so bad. His neighbor said to him, Hey, what was that you kept saying all day? I memorized it. So then he remembered 
and he was happy. And he went to his lesson and he recited on the teacher what he had memorized and he kept going from there. And that man became one of the biggest scholars and he was already advanced in age. So Allah gives the knowledge to whomever he will, male or female. You see Shaykh Nusayba. She's my Shaykh and she's our Shaykh. Allah gives the knowledge to whomever he will. It was said, say to your children, learn the religion. For if you are the youths of a community, for if you are the youths of a community, you are bound to become the seniors. And what is uglier than an ignorant old person? That's pretty clear, I think. It was said, teaching the authentic knowledge of Ahlu Sunnah, including teaching the creed and the religious rules during these times, is one of the fastest ways of reaching wilaya. Wilaya, which is sainthood. Now, I know some of you don't like the word saint. It works anyway. I'm not going to go into a long spill about that. To become a highly righteous, pious Muslim of the highest degree of piety, al-wilaya. That's because in this time, the knowledge is rare. That's one of the small signs of Judgment Day, that the knowledge would go away. So the knowledge is rare. The people of knowledge are few. The Prophet ﷺ spoke about that. So if you are a person who has correct knowledge, teach it. This is one of the things that will help to elevate you faster up into the ranks of wilaya. It was said that Imam Ash-Shafi'i said, let the first thing you start with when fixing your children be fixing yourself. For their eyes are tied to yours. To them, the good is what you deem good. And the ugly is what you dislike. SubhanAllah. I remember as a little kid, seeing all the stuff my mom liked, I say, okay, I like it. My mom likes that movie, that's a good movie. Teach them the book of Allah and do not force them so that they will not get bored. Teach them, yani you might have to push them, yeah. When we say don't force them, that doesn't mean let them run around until they give you the permission to let them learn. No. Tell them, come sit down, it's time to study. Let them get used to studying. Let them get used to having some time dedicated for the religious knowledge. Not all day is playing nonstop, playing and eating and sleeping, and that's it, nonstop. But don't force them to the extent that they get bored, because then the second time, you, they won't be as receptive. Teach them. Observe their limit, depending on how old they are and how smart they are. You might push them 15 minutes. Maybe if it's a little little one, give them 15, 20 minutes. If it's a little bit bigger, give them a half hour, 40 minutes. Give them an hour, maybe. And observe them and watch them. You see them slowing down. You see their, um, you know, what you call looking at their watch. Okay. Let them stop. And don't make the religious knowledge a way of punishing them. If you want to punish your child, make them stand in the corner, make them, you know, write, I won't do that again 1,000 times. Don't say your punishment is to memorize this surah of the Qur'an or this your punishment is to memorize this um, page of religious knowledge because this will make them dislike the religious knowledge. So that's a very bad idea. So teach them the book of Allah and do not force them so that they will not get bored. And don't let them abandon it such that they shun it. Then teach them the easiest poetry and the noblest hadiths. If you're teaching your child the poetry, that means you're teaching them Arabic language. And don't take them out of one science into another until they master it. For the ear being crowded with various discussions scatters the comprehension. For the ear to get crowded with various discussions 
Various topics, one on top of the other, it scatters the comprehension. That's what was reported about Imam Ash-Shafi'i. And it was also said, and this is from Ash-Shafi'i too, who learns Quran will be great in the eyes of the people. Like the one who learn, who memorizes Quran, he's half of the Quran. Who learns Quran will be great in the eyes of the people. And also, when we say learning the Quran, this includes two things. It includes learning how to recite the Quran, and it includes learning the meanings of the ayahs, learning tafsir of Quran. Who learns hadith, his proofs will be strong. And we're saying learning, we're not saying just reading on your own. Who learns the hadiths, then his proofs will be strong. It means... The more he learns the hadiths of the Prophet wasallam, the stronger he will become in argumentation, good argumentation, and inferring. The stronger he will become in inferring, deducing. Not talking about being a mujtahid. Who learns grammar will be respected, and nahu. Who learns Arabic, his disposition will be easy. This one, I'm not quite sure how to explain it. I really don't know how to explain it, but to say that Arabic language makes you understand a lot of things. Just in the world, in, in reality. Who learns math, his opinion will be strong. Who learns fiqh will become noble. Whoever doesn't protect himself... His knowledge will not benefit him. He doesn't protect himself from the sins. Then his knowledge will not benefit him. And the basis of it all is taqwa, God-fearingness. It was said the death of one scholar is more beloved to Iblis than the death of 70 worshippers. 70 worshippers who are not scholars. And that's clear for you now why that would be. Because of the status of a scholar over a worshipper. It was said that the devils argued with each other. They debated with each other. Who is harder on them? The sinful scholar or the worshipful ignorant person? One who's ignorant but worshipful, likes to pray, likes to fast, etc. Has lots of energy to do that, lots of ambition to do that. And another who has lots of knowledge but he doesn't refrain from sin. Who is tougher? So Iblis, he settled the debate for them. And he told them, it's obvious the scholar is tougher for you. And the reason that the scholar is tougher is because the devil cannot fool him. The devil cannot trick the scholar. If the scholar fell into a sin, it won't be because the devil tricked him. It won't be because the devil tricked him. It will be because he just let his nefs get the better of him. But when it comes to the ignorant worshiper, the devil can fool him. Like what was said about a person who was an ignorant worshiper who killed a mouse. And then the devil tricked him into thinking that he shouldn't have done that. So he felt bad. So he took the dead mouse and he hung it around his neck. As an expression of his grief and to show, I guess, his respects for this dead mouse that he feels that he shouldn't have killed. And the dead mouse is nudges, filth. So now this person is praying with najasa on his body, unexcused najasa, so his prayers are invalid. Or how about the time when a light appeared to one of the scholars? And then a voice came from this light saying, Oh my slave, you are absolved of the prayer. You have worshipped me so well and so long that I absolve you of the prayer. You no longer have to pray. So that scholar, what did he do? He said, be gone, devil. And he flagged him and he ignored him. So the light went away. Then later, this devil came back to him and told him, I fooled about 70 people with this trick. How did you know? He said, you came in the form of a light and Allah is not a light. You spoke to me with letters and sounds and Allah's speech is not letters and sounds. And you absolved me of the obligation of the prayer. And even Prophet Muhammad was not absolved of the obligation of the prayer. So what was it that protected this man? It was the knowledge. 
That's why the death of one scholar is more beloved to Iblis than the death of 70 worshipers. Also, the scholar disseminates the knowledge. He's the one who passes the knowledge out to the people. Imam Ali said that the knowledge is better than money because the more you spend the knowledge, the more it increases. While the more you spend the money, the more it decreases. And the knowledge protects you while you protect the money. It was said that there are two who are ambitious and never satisfied. The seeker of the dunya and the seeker of the knowledge. The one, his heart is attached to the dunya and he's making money. He's never satisfied. Billionaires still looking for money. Working hard every day and they already have millions of dollars. Millions. How much is a billion? Is a billion a million millions? A million is a thousand thousands. I think a billion is a million millions. Who has a billion dollars and still works hard every day? And the seeker of the knowledge. When one is truly, his heart is attached to the knowledge, he never wants to stop. All he does is seek the knowledge and learn and study. Busy himself with the knowledge all day. The knowledge is what is important to you. Wake up, get busy with the knowledge. Fall asleep, busy with the knowledge. It was said, there is no mixture better than knowledge with patience. Not patience. Or let's say with being deliberate. Deliberate means taking your time and thinking. Hilm. This is a very good concoction to mix knowledge and deliverance. You have knowledge. Someone asks you a question. You don't have to answer them immediately. You can stop. Pause. Take a moment to think of the answer. Put your words together and then answer the question. Even come back after a day or two or a week and then answer the question. And be deliberate also in other matters, not just the matters of the knowledge. In all your affairs, in your job, in your different encounters. It was said, there is no goodness in worship without knowledge and no goodness in knowledge without understanding. Yes. Among the greatest endowments that Allah can give you is fam, understanding, comprehension. Not merely the ability to memorize, which is good, but being able to memorize a lot, but not being able to understand is very potentially bad. And that's what was one of the problems of Ibn Taymiyyah. That's why they said about him, ilmuhu akbaru min aqli. His knowledge is greater than his intellect. That means he has more knowledge than he can actually comprehend. There is no goodness in knowledge without understanding. So, among the greatest endowments that Allah can give you, the greatest absolutely is faith. Even if you're an absolute moron, but you believe in Allah and his messenger, then you have the greatest of endowments. May Allah protect you. And among the greatest endowments that Allah could give you is intelligence. And among them is understanding. Those are two different things. Intelligence and understanding are not the same thing. And among them is knowledge. There is no goodness in worship without knowledge and no goodness in knowledge without understanding. It was said, do not be ashamed to learn if you do not know. And do not be ashamed to say, I don't know. If you are asked about what you do not know, if you don't know something, go and learn. Don't feel shy or embarrassed or reluctant to go to someone and ask for knowledge. Someone who can teach you and ask. And I remind myself. And if you don't know, don't feel shy to say, I don't know. In fact, you should practice it. Because if you don't practice saying, I don't know, you might find it difficult to say it. That's just reality. You might find it difficult for yourself to say, I don't know, because you don't want to expose your ignorance. So don't feel shy to expose your ignorance when you don't know. Just say, I don't know. And 
Don't say, I don't remember. If you don't know, don't say, I don't remember. Say, I don't know. Don't say, let me review. Say, I don't know. That's so you can break yourself, to make yourself used to that word. La adri, I do not know. Also, another thing that takes practice is being silent when you don't know. Not speaking with ignorance. I had a discussion with a kafir lady. She asked me something where she wanted me to assume an answer about something. I told her, I don't know the answer to this. So she said to me, well, you know, you can just tell me, what do you think? What's your opinion, et cetera, et cetera. What's your guess? And I told her, I don't do that. And she's saying, no, well, you can do it. You should do it. Do it. Tell me. I said, no, I don't do that. I don't know. So we had some discussion about that. And then I told her that I am a person who only wants to say something correct. If I say something out of my mouth, I want it to be right. And she said to me, well, is that really realistic? That you can only say something correct? And I told her, yes. If you are a person who doesn't speak without knowledge, then it is realistic that whenever you speak, what you say is correct. And you don't talk without knowledge. It was said, there is no goodness in the people, but the learned and the learning. The learned and the learning. It was said, if you seek the knowledge to apply it, the knowledge will eventually control you. And if you seek it for anything else, it will only increase you in arrogance. Even if you are getting uncut, pure religious knowledge from pure, trustworthy source. But if your intentions aren't right, while you get that knowledge, it will harm you and it will sicken you and it will increase you in arrogance. You will become arrogant. You will look down on the people. You will see yourself as one who has the knowledge and they don't have the knowledge and that they need to come to you. They need you. And sometimes a person, uh, he withholds a lot of his knowledge so that he would be the only one who has it so that he can keep himself at that status of being the one with the knowledge. While spreading that knowledge is just like giving charity. Don't you give the charity and in your heart you say, Allah replenishes this. I can give this in charity and Allah can return it to me tenfold. The same thing. You have some religious knowledge? Don't say, uh, if I give this knowledge, then someone else will have it then they won't need me. You give that knowledge, perhaps Allah will bless you and increase your knowledge for you. It was said, Ikrima was a slave of Ibn Abbas. He was from the Tabi'un. He said, Ikrima said, Ibn Abbas used to put a shackle on my foot, then teach me Quran and Sunnah. That's what he did with his slave. When Ibn Abbas died, Khalid Ibn Yazid purchased Ikrima from Ibn Abbas' son, for 4,000 dinars. When Ikrimah knew of that, he said, he went to Ibn Abbas's son, you sold your father's knowledge for 4,000 dinars? It's like he's saying, don't you recognize the value of the knowledge that I hold from your father? So he went to Khalid and begged him to cancel the sale. And then he set Ikrima free. If you do have religious knowledge, brothers and sisters, yes, being humble is absolutely the right thing to be. But not at the expense of the da'wah and the knowledge. Let's say, for example, you're the only one among a group of Muslims who knows how to recite Al-Fatiha properly. Don't say, uh, if I put myself out there, that wouldn't be humble. It wouldn't be humble of me to say, I know how to recite Al-Fatiha, come and learn. No. In this case, you do say, in the best way, I know how to recite Al-Fatiha, come and learn. It was said that Malik said, the knowledge is not the ability to narrate plenty. It is a light that Allah puts in the heart. That one, that's a nice one that 
that doesn't require my explaining that to you. That requires you internalizing that one. It was said, worse than a man's betrayal in money is his betrayal in the knowledge. And it was said, the knowledge will not give you some of itself until you give it all of yourself. There's so much religious knowledge that you won't be able to acquire it all. There is so much religious knowledge that the amount of knowledge that you acquire will be in comparison to the totality of knowledge a little bit. That is assuming that you gave it all of your effort. Imagine a person who from sunup to sundown was busy with the religious knowledge and didn't stop being busy with the religious knowledge except for whatever needs they have. Day in, day out, year after year, then inshallah such a person would become very knowledgeable and still in comparison to all of the knowledge there is to be had, his knowledge would be little. So the knowledge will not give you some of itself until you give it all of yourself. And that being said, if you're only giving the knowledge a little bit of effort, let's say one hour per week, then how much knowledge are you going to have? If the only knowledge you hear is when you go to the khutbah on Friday, how much knowledge is a person going to have? And it was said, if the knowledge doesn't benefit you, it will harm you and ignorance won't protect you. And all of that, we've explained it. If the knowledge doesn't benefit you, it will harm you. How will it harm you? It will make you arrogant. How will it benefit you? It will benefit you by many ways, by protecting you. You will know what are the sins. You will know how to conduct yourself. You will know how to perform the worships. You will be able to benefit other people by teaching them. If it doesn't benefit you, it will harm you. How will it harm you? It will make you arrogant. Then your heart will become sick, despite the knowledge you have. And ignorance won't protect you, so you can't stay ignorant. And we already explained how the ignorance will not protect you. Had ignorance protected you, then what? It would be better than knowledge. And as for this last one, it's not in its proper place. This one doesn't belong here. That one belongs here in Islamic beliefs. MashaAllah. And let's stop there.